In 2018, uh, I formed a, a, a plan with the staff to go through a vision planning session, and uh, we began to uh, get ready to launch a campus in 2018, the South Umpqua, and I just felt like it was time to uh, start again and, and really look at what the vision was. And over that time and since that time, we have been building and working as a staff on a vision. And uh, it was very important. It was very critical because even in that time uh, when COVID hit, the vision that we were already putting in place was something that guided us through that time. And all through the transitions that we've made, the vision that we were laying out uh, is, was, has been so helpful to guide us through that periods and those periods and situations. And that vision is what we're sharing with you uh, today. What, we, what Craig started last week and I'm sharing with you today comes from that vision that the staff has worked on, the staff is actually putting into place and, and beginning to live out, as well as, uh, as the leadership board has come around and has agreed this is the direction that we need to go. You know, we've been a, a church of, um, of you know, uh, multi-site, taking the church to, the, to uh, the, the county. Reaching the county has always been a challenge, always been encouraging, always been a vision of us. How are we going to impact the county with the gospel of Christ? And we've honed this in to be what we believe more focused on that. We've moved some aspects of being a church that gathers to a church that scatters with the gospel, a church from addition to the church of multiplication. And that's the essence of the vision that Craig talked about last week and I'm going to be sharing with you this week. Building four generations uh, is kind of the encapsulating idea and uh, Craig shared three different ideas of, of how this is to be lived out. Locations for gathering and sending out. So we want to have uh, locations that are paid off that are sending uh, places where the church is going out and impacting the world, raising up leaders and mobilizing missionaries. And Family Church has a long history of, of growing leaders. 99% of our staff are, are, uh, are people that have come to the Family Church and then has been selected, raised up, and now are leading on every capacity of what we do, and we want to continue that. And, uh, and then the last one here is saturating Douglas County and reaching the nations with the gospel. And that's really what I want to focus on in my talk this morning is that this is really about saturating Douglas County and reaching the nations with the gospel. And so you can, you know, I, I thought about where do you start? And I want to start with... Uh, where Jesus started. The very first time church is mentioned in the Bible, Jesus was talking about it. And it was found in Matthew 16, 18. And he said, um, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will build my church. And I just have, uh, over the years, just been impacted by this vision ca casting moment what was Jesus thinking in his mind? What was he seeing, knowing he was uh, God and could see the future? What was, he, what was in his mind about what this church would look like, what it would do, how it would have impact? And I qu the question that comes to my mind is, as you think about the church, I wonder how closely is what you understand the church to be to be so similar to what Jesus was thinking, or is it vastly different? See, I, think, I don't think the church that Jesus was thinking was a building. I don't think he was, he was uh, concerned about the building side. I don't think he was thinking about programs. I don't think he was thinking about events. And he definitely, I don't think, was thinking that it would somehow become some kind of a club that was exclusive with members that, you know, um, somehow thought they were close here and then they were extremely different from those on the outside. See, from the outset, uh, 
Jesus had a clear vision. And I want to hopefully this morning is just lay in to what that, that vision looks like. But he didn't stop there with, I will build my church, which is so encouraging that it's he who's going to do it. But it says, and the gates of hell shall not stand against it. In other words, it's an unstoppable church. Even when Jesus was on earth and what followed in the book of Acts, religious leaders prevailed against the church, but the church was unstoppable. Rome and the empire and the leaders were bringing all kinds of challenge to the church, but the church was unstoppable. Persecution has been part of the, of the story of the church all along, but the church is unstoppable. You can, you, the government can come and lock the doors of the buildings in the church, but the church is unstoppable. You can become a prisoner because you stand for Christ, and as we've seen people around the world be uh, persecuted and, and put in prison for following Jesus, but the church is unstoppable. And I think that until we understand what the church is and its unstoppability, uh, we will not achieve the vision that we are laying out last week and this week. And so Craig shared a, a picture last week of the global church. This is a, just a picture of the church around the world and all the dots are all the believers who are following Jesus. And then there's that one red dot. That red dot is uh, just a picture of those who are pastors and paid staff in church. And often this is how we see the church is, um, is a, a focus on the leaders of the church. And, you know, it, many have said that when you look at the church, there are tw uh, 20% 20, 20 of the church, 20% of the leaders of the church are doing 80% of the work. It's been also said it's the church often is like a football game. There are 80,000 people in the stands badly in need of exercise and 22 people on the field badly in need of rest. And this is not the church that Jesus had in mind. This is, this is more of a mindset of go to church, not be the church. And so what, what was it that Jesus had in mind for us to be and so there are four different statements that I'm going to look at in the book of Ephesians. So you can turn to Ephesians chapter 1. And in that, we're going to just pull out these four ideas of what the church is. And the first one is the church is the people of God. We, we are the people of God. And those who have placed their faith in Jesus and are walking by faith with Jesus are the people of God. They, uh, they are uh, those who, who Christ indwells, and we are the church. The church is not a building. The church is not a program. The church are the people of God. And in chapter 1, verse 3, this is how this, uh, this passage starts. He says, blessed be the God, Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realm. Then say that if you pray hard enough, you will start getting some blessings. And there's, he says, you have already received them. There's nothing else to give. It's there for you right now. You have already received receive the blessings. The question is, are you living that out? Are you enjoying the, the, the blessings? Are you experiencing the blessings? And there, he's it's in Christ with every spiritual blessing. So I, for the sake of time, I'm not going to read through the passage other than just share just clearly who you are as a church. What is your identity? And this is so critical. When you come to faith, 
who you are changes from who you were. We are no longer uh, of this world. We're no longer uh, following the, the, the God of this world, Satan. We are now following Jesus. And he is our, our, uh, our master and Lord. And as a result, this is, this is our identity. We have been chosen by God. He wanted me. He wanted you. He chose you. He, he drew you out of, uh, of Satan's hand and brought him into his own. He declared you right now holy and righteous. You have a standing with God where he is not uh, holding anything against you. Holy means you're separated unto God. So righteous means you're in right standing with God because of what Jesus did. You are declared uh, blameless. And as God sees you, he sees you blameless. As it says in Colossians, free from accusation. Wow, wow, what a, what a powerful thought. You know yourself, you go, yeah, but I know too much. You know, I, this and, but this is the view of God to you. May not be what you're living in your life today, but this is how God sees you. This is who you really are. You're adopted into his family. You now are, you now to belong to his family. And you, there's, there's just, you belong. (laughs) You're part of something that he has desired from the very beginning of creation. You're loved without conditions. This unconditional love that he has for you. And you're forgiven of all sin. That's That's who you are. That is your identity, and we are the church. We are his children, and as followers of Jesus, that's who we are. And because that's who we are, it can begin to make an impact of how we live. If you don't don't believe that to be true about you, that will not show out into who you live on a day-to-day basis. But this is the gospel. This is what the gospel is. This is the good news. And the question is, are you looking at this list and saying, okay, that might be true? Or are you looking at that and beginning to experience this reality of joy and grace and peace and just this is this is the result of god loving you a lot of people i talk to these say yeah i know god loves me but they only understand it from an intellectual they don't understand it from experiential and what i want to impress on you today is if you're going to be the church if you truly are the church, you came into the, uh, the opportunity to be the, in the family of God by faith, and by faith you must believe this to be true. So you are the church. You have this identity. You also are filled with the Spirit. The, the church is the people of God filled with the Spirit of God. And uh, when Christ, uh, Christ came into you when you place your faith in him. So uh, the spirit of God is made his home with you. Look what it says here in Ephesians verse, chapter 1, verse 13. In him, in Christ, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel, the good news of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. When you heard the gospel, you were sealed. The spirit of God came to live in you. You restored in relationship with God. You were transitioned. There was a transition from death spiritual death to spiritual life, from an enemy of God to the family of God, from never being good enough to now being righteous. 
the Spirit of God lives in you. And salvation came. Salvation is being saved from the penalty of sin. That's your past. That's what's happened the day you said yes to Jesus. Salvation is, uh, is from the, uh, the power of sin, which is what we deal with today. It's the present. And the Spirit of God is at work so that we can overcome the power of sin. And salvation is being saved from the presence of sin. And one day we will be forever with Jesus in heaven. And so the church is the people of God, filled with the Spirit of God, fueled by the power of God. And that's a, an opportunity that we have Christ living in us. Jesus Christ died for me and you so that he could live in me and you, so that he could work through you and me. And we have this power that, that, is, that is in us. And looking at uh, verse 15 of chapter 1 as well, Paul is praying this prayer, and this is a prayer that I have for you as a church. I, have, I pray for that, uh, for this is the reason because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints. I do not cease to give thanks for you and remember you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, and that you may know what is the hope to which you have been called, what is the riches of your inheritance in the saints. And I just want you to, to think about this. The Spirit, capital, that's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is giving you wisdom and revelation in order for your hearts to be enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you and the riches of his glorious inheritance. What is that inheritance? What we looked at. We're holy, we're righteous, we're loved. We're, God, is, uh, God wants you to, to be, he wants you to see, he wants you to know, he wants you to experience what he's offered to you. And I pray that you will see that. And the immeasurable, he wants you to know the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his great might that he would in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places. And this is a awesome opportunity to see that there is this power. There is a power of God that lives in you that's ready to step in to whatever God has for you. This is a saving power from death to life. It's an overcoming power over sin and temptation. It's a transformational power from uh, to live your own your identity in Christ. It's a disciple-making power to love people, bless people, serve people, and make disciples of all friends and neighbors so that they can know God and be also part of the family. And so we're fueled by this power that goes on far above all rule and authority and power and dominion above every name that is above that name, not only in this age, but in the one to come. And so this Jesus, who has demonstrated power by resurrecting power and now stands in authority over all dominion, lives in us, and in the power is available to us in what he has for us to do. So the church is the people of God, filled with the Spirit of God, fueled by the power of God to achieve the mission of God. 
We are not just to be a number of dots on a page and look to the red dot. We are not just to be learners and students, but we are to be actively involved. So often it's like God is tapping us on the shoulder to do something, but we, the response is, well, but I don't know how. I, don't, I, I can't. You know, I, I, I can't do that. Well, you have the power of God in you, and we have been called to a mission of God. And we are not powerless, but we have a mission. We are invited to join God in his mission every day on this earth. The church is not a body, it's not a building, it's a body. The church is not a program, it's a people. The church is not an event, it's an identity. The church is a movement of God on earth today. It's not a place you just come, we come, and this is a place where we gather so that we can be challenged out so that 24-7 we can live it out every day. We're on mission, and I'm afraid that often our, t- our focus is we already have a mission. These are the things that we think God would want us to do. These are the things that we're believing that needs to happen, and we're asking God to, please, God, join my mission and please re- answer these requests. And God is saying, wait a minute. I've invited you to my family, and I'm on a mission, and will you today join me in my mission? In Ephesians 1, 22, it, the chapter ends, and he put all things under Jesus' feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. When I think of that verse, and I've done a lot of thinking about it and looked in different translations and say, man, that is, that the church is the body of Christ, the fullness of him who fills all in all. That's what the church is. And it fills all in all. And I, and I, I just, when I think of that, the word that comes to mind, the idea that comes to mind is saturate. Saturate. And I want to, um, there's, uh, you know, thinking how is the best way to, um, to describe this? Because you can go water that fills a sponge and the sponge gets full and you just can, the water just continues to, to fill, and then at some point the, f- the sponge is totally saturated, and from that, then it, 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 it no longer is able to take any more water in. And so here's how I wanted to, to approach this. So I want you to think about the red as being love, the green being joy, and the blue being peace. When before Christ comes into our life, and I want you to think about this is the potential of your of what saturation would look like if you were living fully saturated with with the love of God, fully saturated with understanding your identity in Christ, which produced the joy and the peace, and your walk with God in prayer and in time with Him and in, in would, would present something in you that you would be fully saturated. But when we come to Christ, we have this, this understanding that's pretty small. And over time, we need to every day remind ourselves of the good news of the gospel. And as we remind ourselves the joy and the peace and the love that is available to us expands. And as we spend more time with that, it expands. And as it expands in us, it brings more love. We feel more loved. We feel more uh, belonging. We feel more joy. We feel more peace. We understand the grace of God as we walk this journey and we learn about that, and we also overflow to others. Others can see more love. They can see us more joyful. They can see us more peaceful. They can see us 
standing in, in difficult situations, watching us go through very, very hard things in life, and they go, man, how do you do that? Because Christ is living in me, and I am reminding myself regularly of the gospel. I'm saturating my life with the truth of my identity. I'm saturating my, my understanding of who my loving Father is, what Jesus has done for me, what Jesus has called me to do, and I'm joining God every day in his mission. And as a result, I am having an imp- it's impacting my life in great ways and it's impacting my family in great ways and my neighbors and my friends in the workplace because they're seeing somebody who's living in unbelievable, unconditional love and joy and peace because I'm saturating myself with the gospel. The gospel is that good news of Jesus Christ. I also want to look at this in another um, passage in, in the NIV, because I like how it says this, and it kind of gives another thought on this. And God placed all things under Jesus' feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. The church, all of this is for the church which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. And so this is a picture I wanted to also, not just is there a saturation of me being saturated with this gospel that goes out from me, but I also want to look at how it looks as a church as a whole. We have three campuses in Sutherland and in and, 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 um, and, and South Umqua and, and in... Um, Right outside Roseburg there. <laughs> and so we've got these campuses that, are, uh, that God has called us to because we have taken the idea that we're bringing the church to Douglas County. But what will it look like if, 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 as we grow and that we practice the blessed rhythm? And as we practice that blessed rhythm, we begin to... Uh, to Every day, join God in what he's doing, praying for our lost family and friends, living this overflowing, saturated gospel life before them, building relationship with them, eating with them. And there's these, there is a pamphlet that you can pick up. If you um, are new to family church, you go, what is that about? Pick this up, and it kind of gives you a little bit of understanding. But as we continue to live out this blessed rhythm, and the gospel is spreading everywhere in every place, and we have this vision that it will reach and saturate Douglas County. And so we are called to this mission. You are invited to this mission. And... What would, how awesome would that be to see what God could do? A couple things I want to bring out as we achieve this mission for God. You have a calling. In, in Ephesians chapter 2, 20, verse 20, he says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So God is, God is, cr- in your experiences, in your gifting, in how God has worked in your life, you are called to make disciples, but in very particular ways. And and we have a a life on purpose uh, class that helps you really discover what that mission is. And if you haven't taken that yet or looked into that, that's a great place to, to more hone into that. If you want to start as a starting place, you can take the GPS, got, um, gifts, passions, and, and uh, uh, skills assessment that uh, can be taken online, and it's in your program as a link of how to, to, to find that. But there is a mission that you've been called to, and so not only do you have this grand opportunity to join the church in this, but you have specific opportunity to do so. We also have an impact that God is at work at, and that's found in 
Ephesians 3, 17 through 20. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all and uh, all the fullness of God now to him who is able to do far more abundantly what we ask or think in essence we have received love and Paul is saying that let us understand, let us experience, let us grow in that love of Christ and be filled with all fullness of God so that we can live this far uh, abundant life. And I, I just want to point you to this passage, now to him, now to God who is able how are we going to how are we going to accomplish this this mission this focus this vision that God is God is able God is able in whatever problem whatever circumstance whatever situation you find yourself God is able what a what a what a a, a statement of hope and as we pray about being filled with the gospel impacting the world with the gospel that the, the, so that Douglas County and the world would be saturated with the gospel, God is able. And he's able not just to do what we think, but is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us. To him be glory in the church in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever Amen. God is able. God is going to accomplish his work through his church. And we have been invited to, do, to, to experience that every day. Here is the, the vision, that statement that we came with um, as we were building this vision. Gospel saturation through you, through me, as an overflow that leads to a multiplication movement, that disciples will make disciples, and that God work on earth will grow around the world, starting in your home, in your neighborhood, in your workplace, and throughout Douglas County and the world. That's my prayer for you. I think that's an exciting vision that has been stirring in my mind. And I'm, I'm stepping off the team. Uh, I'll be here until the end of the, of the year. I'll still be at Family Church. But I'm stepping off the team because I have replaced myself. I have uh, built up a, a, a team who are taking my place and are going to continue to lead this vision. And I couldn't be more excited about the team that is leading and the vision that is going forward. The role that I am playing as I step off is to be a catalyst uh, in, in Douglas County, uh, among the churches, as well as help and come alongside as I step under the leadership here to make disciples who make disciples both here and around the world. And I'm so excited for what this team is about to do. And I just hope and pray that you will join us in, in taking that daily walk for what God has for you. And I'm going to be excited to see what your story is going to look like as you do so. God bless you. Thank you. Well, thank you for joining us today. I'm so grateful that you watched online and uh, we're praying for you that you will uh, be stirred by this vision and be a part of making an impact where you go. And just as, a, as we close, just some things we want you to be aware of. Uh, here is what we pray that you will do is on a day-to-day -day basis, have this personal gospel saturation that we were talking about that is renewing your identity in Christ every day. So what does that look like? So 
just spending that time with God and in your prayer time, reminding the, the aspects of, of uh, Ephesians 1. Go back and reread that and just highlight and, re- and mark. Make sure you clearly understand what God has called you to be in your identity. And then saturate the world with the blessed rhythm. And again, uh, just begin in prayer t- and invite uh, and, and, and join God in what he's invited you to, to join him in his work and follow each step of the way. God bless you as you do. Let me pray. Father, thank you for our time today, and I pray, God, that as people are, uh, are, are hearing this message from you, that, God, you will uh, just stir in our hearts to step into your mission, to your, uh, to your gospel, and may it not just come to us as something that's for us, but that it would truly change us and it would also be a powerful opportunity to reach the family, neighbors, friends, work, work associates as we uh, saturate the world with the gospel of Jesus. And we ask in the name of Jesus, amen. God bless you.